Hello. So I'm here to talk about nothing. And nothing in one of its more devious forms, namely zero. So first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what zero is and how it's been used by other cultures. And from there, I'd like to segue into discussion of number systems and our understanding of them more generally. So the first question, kind of the big question that we have to ask is, what is zero? And the answer is that it's a lot of things. <laughs> what we think of as zero is actually a whole bunch of concepts entangled into one. So first, there's zero, the symbol. It's a mark and a notational system. For us, that's the classic goose egg symbol. But then there's zero as a nothing. And this is kind of what zero is most famous for, because it comes with all these conceptual problems. Like, how can you have a symbol for a nothing? And even more perplexing, how can a nothing have properties? But another very important role that zero plays is that of place value holder. In a positional notation system, like our own, zero is used to mark empty place value columns. So we can take a relatively small collection of symbols and uniquely represent any number we want. So we can put a zero at the beginning and end of a number to show the number's overall magnitude, or we can put it in the middle of a number, like to separate between 11 and 101. So in our system, all these different sides of zero are linked into a cohesive number, the number zero. But that's not always the case. In fact, the different sides of zero are relatively independent. So you could have one without another, or you could have all of them without having them linked into a cohesive number zero. Now this matters if we want to study the emergence of zero. Because if we want to pinpoint when and where zero was first discovered or invented, then we have to decide what counts as a zero. Is it having all of the aspects, or we'll say just a nothing suffice? Now the traditional story is that zero was first developed in India in the first millennium CE. But I'd like to take a closer look at this picture. So the Indians probably were the first to really use a cohesive zero, <coughs> like our own. And they were also probably the first to really talk about doing calculations of zero. Brahmagupta and others wrote treatises outlining how you could do, say, division or subtraction with zero. They even were aware of the problems associated with division by zero. But I'd like to place this in context by looking at other ancient cultures and the number systems they used. So first, I'd like to look at a number system that didn't use any of the aspects of zero, the Greeks. And then I'd like to look at a number system that did, the Babylonians. So talking about the Greeks is kind of a tricky business, because they used a whole smorgasbord of number systems. But I'll focus on two, the Attic and the Alphabetic, which are, uh, which are additive systems. So additive systems are those like the Roman numerals, as opposed to positional systems, like our own. So the Greeks weren't using any of the aspects of zero. They had no symbol, no nothing, and being an additive system, they just had no need for a place value zero. But it's interesting to take a closer look at why they had no nothing zero. Now the Greeks often thought of zero in a very physical way, representing, say, the number four as four stones in the sand. And you can see how it would be difficult to represent a number like nothing using stones in the sand. And zero is not the only victim here. You run into problems with any sort of abstract number, like the negative numbers or the imaginary numbers. Furthermore, many Greeks thought of numbers as having physical characteristics. Like the Pythagoreans thought numbers had weight and spatial location. And again, you see how it's difficult to reconcile such an understanding of numbers with abstract numbers like zero. So the Greeks weren't major players in the development of zero. But the Babylonians were. Now, the Babylonians, who lived in what is now Iraq, had several more or less distinct phases in their history. But I want to talk about Old Babylonia, which was roughly 2000 to 1600 BCE. So I'd like to go through the different concepts of zero as a sort of checklist and see which ones they used and which ones they didn't. So they had no symbol for zero, and they weren't using a nothing zero. But when it comes to place value zero, things were a little bit more complicated. On the one hand, they did have it, but then on the other, they didn't. So the Babylonians didn't use a zero at the beginning or end of the number to show its overall magnitude. For us, every time we go to a new power of 10, we add a zero and start cycling through our digits again. So a zero separates, say, 10 and 100, or 1 and 0.1. But the Babylonians didn't do this. So every time they went to a new power of 60, because remember, they used base 60, not base 10. So every time they went to a new power of 60, they would start cycling through their numbers again but they wouldn't add a zero to show an increase or decrease in magnitude. The result is that 1, 60, and 3,600 are all represented by the same symbol, which would be analogous to, in our system, representing 1, 10, and 100 by the same symbol. 
The result is they would use context to differentiate between their numbers. But I told you that the Babylonians did use another zero place value. That was the zero in the middle of a number. So in numbers like 101, the Babylonians would have a zero. But remember, they have no symbol for it. So they would use a space to represent it, which is one way to get around the conceptual problems associated with having a symbol for zero. Now it's important to note that the distinctions aren't actually as sharp as I've drawn them here. You will find a rare tablet where a nothing zero is used, or where there's a symbol to represent a place value zero. What's interesting, though, is that these aren't linked into a cohesive number, like in our own system. So it seems the Babylonians actually had no conceptual connection between the different sides of zero. Had no conceptual connection between different sides of zero. And indeed, some researchers even said that they thought of place value zero as more of a decimal point than a number. Not in terms of, of what it did, but just that it was seen as less than a full number. Moreover, the Babylonian conception of zero changed throughout their history. So in later periods, they actually did have a symbol for zero, for the place value zero. So the Babylonians aren't really giving India a run for its money as being the first to use a cohesive zero. But they do influence how we think about the development of mathematical concepts. The Babylonians tell us that zero didn't just pop up in India, but rather that it went through hundreds of years of refinement first. So this is very esoteric stuff, and it is totally fair if right now you're wondering why this matters. But ask yourself, are you now wondering why the Babylonians use such a complicated and limited system? Or do you feel quite sure that our system is better than the Greeks? If you do, then you're absolutely not alone. Lots of researchers from the 20th century felt similar. But that these views come to us so naturally, and without even trying the system in question, is at best misguided, and at worst prejudiced. Why? Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Greek system. Given that they used an additive system, it can be hard to see any benefit, just because it's so foreign to us who use a positional system. But there are some. Like when it comes to representing a large, larger number, like a million, we might need a whole string of symbols to represent it, where they can get away with just one. So we need seven symbols to represent a million. But the Greeks just needed one. Of course, this isn't to say that there won't be numbers where the Greeks need more symbols. But if the Greeks are selecting numbers or symbols for their commonly used numbers, these other numbers with more unwieldy symbols just won't come up that much in everyday life. Also, I said that the Greeks had these very geometric representations of numbers, and that that was sort of, a, in a sense, a liability for their system, because it posed problems for representing abstract numbers, like zero. But in a way, it was also a benefit, because it was very useful for doing geometric proofs or for representing number series, like the squares, that could be represented in this geometric way. And a lot of work in Greek mathematics was done in those areas. But I'd like to talk a little bit more also about the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians actually could do some pretty impressive stuff with their math. They could solve quadratic problems, and they had an approximation for the irrational number of root 2, which is, again, pretty impressive for the time in which they lived. They were also decent astronomers, and in fact, their astronomy was so influential in the ancient world that cultures that didn't otherwise use base 60 picked it up for use in astronomy calculations. So Ptolemy, a famous Greek, used base 60 fractions in his book, The Almagest. And in fact, base 60 fractions are pretty handy in general, because so many numbers divide into 60, like 1, 2, 3, 4, and a whole slew of others, compared to base 10, which has a measly 1, 2, 5, and 10 that divide into it. This is the fact that Babylonians exploited for their division, because if you have lots of terminating fractions, then you have lots of terminating reciprocals. Remember, dividing by 2 is just the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 half, say. But there are also benefits to the Babylonian treatment of zero. Like, when it comes to representing number in context, or, or uh, thinking of numbers in context, we still do that. If I told you that it costs 275 to metro here, and it costs 275 to take a plane to Vancouver, you would probably know that it was 275, $2.75 to go on the metro, and $275 to go on the plane. And when we're doing calculations, like say multiplication, we often just ignore place value and only go in afterward and add things like decimal points and zeros. So all in all, this isn't to say that one number system is better than another, but rather it's to say that none is best. In evaluating other number systems, you need to evaluate them within the context of how they were used. And most of all, you need to get away from any sort of covert assumptions that ours is this holy grail that all the others are evolving to. 
After all, base 10 isn't the only base used today by any stretch of the imagination. We use base 2 in computers, base 8 in industrial processes, and base 60 and base 12 are used in time. Thus, we need to see that there is no best number system or best base, because best doesn't exist outside of context and use. So, this is a realization that I think has great relevance for all of us, because if cultural bias can be exposed to have infiltrated math, a field associated with objectivity and rigor, then perhaps we need to worry where else such biases lie unnoticed. Thank you.